Cindy up here. Yeah, she's awesome. Put up with him, I guarantee you. If you have your Bibles this morning, turn with me to Matthew chapter 22. We're going to look at, on Family Sunday, talk about a little love, talk about the firm foundation. If we're going to have momentum, if we're going to live epic lives, we have to have this correct. Matthew 22, going to read verse 34 through 38. It says, but when the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered themselves together. One of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, telling him, Teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all of your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. Pray with me. Lord, we love you. We thank you for this day, God, the opportunity to just come and set in your love, to be reminded, God, of how you do love us. God, we thank you for the opportunity that you give us, Father. We ask that your Holy Spirit would come in this place. God, that you would meet us here today. Father, that you would meet needs, that you would change minds, that you would touch lives. We ask you to have your way in this service. In Jesus' name, and everybody said? Amen. Amen. So high five somebody and say, I'm glad you're here today. It's a good thing to come to the house of the Lord. Sometimes I think we've, we've thought it it's ain't no fun coming to church. It's no fun because we got, you know, some of this stuff. My son this morning is saying, it's no fun to come to church. And I'll tell you why he said, because he did some bad stuff. He was hiding under the pool table downstairs. And so right now he's thinking church is not fun. But anyway, it's a fun thing to come to church. It's a good day that we get to come and spend in the presence of the Lord. And you know what? Sometimes we need to be corrected that we don't need to be hiding under the pool table. Some of us don't like correction. That's why we don't like coming to church, but that's a different message. Anyway, we're talking about love today. We're kind of starting a new little series over the next month or so, but it's understanding that we've been talking about momentum and we've been talking about all year living an epic life. And if we're ever going to live an epic life, if we're ever going to have momentum with the Lord, then it involves love. It involves love. We're not going to do it. doesn't matter how much we know. doesn't matter how many good things we do. If we have not love, we are going to struggle. We must receive the love from God, which is a hard thing for some of us because some of us think we're unlovable and some of us think we're untouchable and some of us think we don't need it. But we're going to have to learn to receive the love of God. And then we're going to have to learn how to Give the love of God. Give it to God. Give it to other people. Last week, I shared part of my story, part of my understanding where my momentum began. I, I, I talked about some of that, but at the core of my story, at the core of my journey is this. It's the love of God. It had nothing to do with something I did. It had nothing to do with uh, lucking out. It had to do with the love of God. Because here's the thing. I did not understand it at the time. I didn't understand it when I began my journey, but it was all because of his love. His love. I shared about him forgiving me, him releasing me, him giving me freedom, him putting hope inside of me, him giving me a hunger for his word, beginning to give me opportunities in life to represent him, empowering me with his Holy Spirit. And throughout my journey, the point is this, throughout my journey, there was love. There was this perfect love. It was him revealing his love to, he, to me the same way he wants to do for all of us. And this love is what changed my life. The love of God is what changes us. Just keeping rules or doing some good stuff or saying a prayer is not going to change our life. But the love of God will change our life forever. The love of God drives out fear. Amen. It drives out the fear of failing. It drives out the fear of not being good enough. The fear of representing God and trying to be different. The fear of being uncomfortable. That's what love does. It changes and it becomes greater in us than anything else. I'll tell you this just to tie it back into to what we did last week. But I told you about how I had surrendered to God and was saved. And I knew I was saved in 1993. But then there's this period of time and there's these years up until about 1998 
into the year 2000 when, when the love of God crushed me. The love of God swallowed me up, and it was no longer about me anymore, and it was no longer, and I've struggled with that, you know, because when the love of God comes and gets you, and you just begin to see how awesome God is in spite of all your junk, in spite of your past, in spite of your thoughts, in spite of everything, God says, I love you. It opens up our eyes and begins to let us really begin to see. So in the scripture that we read today, beginning this religious man he's a pharisee he's an intelligent man says he's a lawyer and he comes to jesus and he says hey he says what is the greatest commandment and jesus of course famous scripture that we all know he says you love the lord your god with all your heart with all your mind with all your soul and with all your strength you know you seek him first you seek first the kingdom of god but if we think about it what does that what does that really mean How does that work? I remember a friend of mine at a church service I did in Kentucky probably six or seven years ago, and he's from Australia, and we really connected, and I shared about the kingdom of God. I shared about seeking the kingdom of God first, and a couple days later he called me and he says, hey, that was really good, but how do you do that? And, of course, you know, when when you think you know something, it's just like, well, you, you know, you just do it. Right? I mean, you just seek God first. You just serve Him. But when you really begin to think about it, what does that look like? What does that look like if I'm at this point, and I'm I'm serious about it, but I'm like, how do I do this? I talked to Pastor Cody this week, early in the week, and he said the same thing that this guy had asked him. He says, how do you love the Lord your God with all of your heart? How do you do that? What does that mean? And, And I begin to understand We know what we're supposed to do. We know we're supposed to love God. We know we're supposed to live for God because he says, seek me first. Because he says it's his desire and his will that we would love God. But how do we do it? And it's understanding that until we really understand how much God loves us, that we really can't love correctly. It's just going to be some skewed version of God's love. Do we know that God loves us? Do you understand that how much he loves you? It has nothing to do with what you achieve. It has nothing to do with, 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 your, with your ability or, or how much you pray or if you even come to church. God loves us. So how do we, how do we love God? Move along. How do, we, how do we get there? What is the action? Because how many of you know that talk is cheap? Talk is cheap. Your spouse don't want to hear your words. They want to see it. They want to know it. They want to feel it. They want to experience. Your children don't want to hear your words just when you tell them at night, and that's the only time you ever tell them all day long. They want to see it. They want to experience. They want to be a part of it. Talk is cheap. Our words are important, but if we don't do anything to back up our words, our words are not going to mean very much. I don't know about you, but I never cared for big talkers, probably because I wasn't a real big talker, but it was always like, well, show me what you can do. Let's see it. Let's, let's put our money where our mouth is, so to speak. And you know what? I don't think God is real impressed with our talk either. Can we be real? We need to understand this. Think about it. How many people say, oh, I love God? I love God. But then these same people that say that I love God live the, their life throughout the week, and there could be a case built against us that says, love God? You love God? You're telling me that you love God? Really? We need to understand simply today, I'm saying this, that love is more than a confession. Love is more than a declaration. It is more than just talk. It is more than just mouth service. Love is an action. Somebody say, love is an action. It's not a feeling. It's not an emotion that our culture's turned it into. And when I feel like it and when you do right to me, when you're good to me, I'm going to love you. But when I don't feel like it or you don't do right, I'm not going to love you. That's not the love of God. The love of God is this. We already said it. But the love of God is an agape love that I don't deserve it and I can't earn it and I I can't do anything. God is just going to love us. And when we learn how much God loves us, guess what? We're called to love God in this same way. We're called to love Him back is our expression of receiving it. Isaiah 29 verse 13. The Lord said... Because this people draw near to me 
with their words and they honor me with lip service, but yet they remove their hearts far from me. This is their reverence. This is what they're saying is love. They consist of traditions. They consist of going through the motions. In other words, they're saying the right stuff, but the overflow of their heart is showing something else. It's expressing itself and it's saying a completely different message. So my question for us today is, how do we love God? How do we love God? Now, we could spend hours on this, and obviously we don't have that much time on a family Sunday. I said I need to be moving along. Some of the moms are saying already. But we're going to have a simple thought about this. How do we love God? Jesus says in John 14, verse 15, he says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. If you love me, you're going to do what I'm asking you to do. And 1 John 5, 3. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments. This is it. Now, some of us would say the commandments, that's the Old Testament. We're, not, we're, we're in the grace era, right? We live according to grace. But yet Jesus says, if you love me, you're going to do this stuff. You're going to listen to my voice because it's not about keeping rules. It's not about us doing it to earn our way. But it's about us walking in obedience because the love that God has given us. Amen? 1 John 2, 4 and 5, it says, The one who says I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar. And and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him the love of God has truly been perfected. And we know that we are in him. See, if we love God with all of our heart, I'm simply saying this. We're going to be striving for his will and we're going to be striving to obey what he's saying to us we're going to follow him we're not just going to do whatever we want to do we're going to strive to follow God how well do we follow let me ask you this question one more time do you love God today of course we do but for the remainder of this service just for fun we're going to take a little love test y'all up for a test today We're going to take a little love test just simply according to what we're reading today. Do we obey God's commands? Which confirms our love or are we liars? Because we said we love God. And we know that there's many commands and they're all important and they all have good stuff. But today we're just going to look at a few that I think sometimes we ignore. But he says, if you love me, you're going to obey my commands. Are y'all ready? Because y'all are kind of like this right here. And I mean, I got to get going. I feel certain. Y'all are going to cause me to have a heart attack because I'm going to start trying too hard. But here's the first one. If we love God, check this out. You're going to love this one. You will repent. Matthew 4, 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent, for the time is now. This is a message that the church today does not want to hear. And so they say that a lot of people don't want to preach it. Why? Because we would rather feel good about ourselves than actually be good. We'd rather hear somebody sugarcoat stuff and make me feel good about the stuff that's going on in my life instead of being challenged to become a child of God and walk in a place that is God's will for us. If we love God, I'm going to say this, And some of you may not like it, but if we love God, we simply cannot continue to live in sin and have some of the lifestyles that we've had in our life. Amen? I don't know about you, but when the love of God hit me, I couldn't do the same anymore. Now, there was a temptation, and I wanted to, but the love of God wouldn't allow me to do it. It wouldn't allow me to treat people in my life the same way. It wouldn't allow me to put the same things in my body that I used to, that I enjoyed doing, I thought, but the love of God simply wouldn't allow me to do it because... And, 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 it's, and so our culture's mindset is, well, it's just who I am. How many of you bought into that? Because I was there. This is just who I am. When I'm, you know, at this point in my life, this is just who I am. That's just what I do. This is just how we act, you know. We're a little bit rural. I mean, we're just, this is what we do in the country. And by the way, you, we all sin. I mean, you heard the preacher say it. I mean, we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, right? We've all sinned. We're all sinners, So what's the point in changing? I mean, God is full of love, 
and he's full of grace. It really doesn't matter what we do. Do you know that there's a movement in our culture this day that says it doesn't matter what you do because God loves you and there's nothing you can do to mess it up. There's nothing, listen, there's nothing you can do to take away the love of God, but there is things that we do that removes us from the love of God where we can't receive it. And again, if we have not the love of God, we are not going to live a different life. We're going to listen to the enemy that says just be who you are, keep doing what you're doing, and at the end of the day, we're going to miss out. John prepared the way and said, repent, for he's coming. The light of the world, when Jesus showed up again, he says, repent, for the kingdom is at hand. Repent. We don't like this word. But repent is important. Repent is to change my mind about stuff. The way I look at things is to change my direction and begin moving away from this thing that was hurting me. It's not just saying, I'm sorry that I got caught. I'm sorry that I got found out. I'm sorry that I did this today. And then in a couple days later, doing it again, repent is to admit that I'm wrong. <laughs> How long has it been since you admitted that you're wrong? Because some of us never want to admit we're wrong. We would rather tell everybody the good stuff in our life and tell everybody what's wrong with them. And we never admit that we're wrong. And can I tell you that when we stand before God, we are all wrong. Let us get in the habit of saying, I'm wrong. Because we've all been wronged. And if we never begin to repent and turn away from it, we're damaging ourselves. We're damaging the, this relationship. Listen, God's always going to love us. But it damages. It hurts God's heart. And it damages me because it affects this relationship. I repent because I know my wrong hurts God. And it hurts the things he has for me. I don't repent just because, I, well, that's what it says, and if I repent, then I'm good, and I can go on and do it again. No, we repent because we need to be cleansed, because he's calling us to do something different because of his love. How many of you, do we forget? Do we forget that Jesus died for the things that we deem in our life is no big deal? This is what everybody else is doing, so what difference does it make? And we forget that Jesus died for the sins which you and I are comfortable in. Do we love God? Do we repent? He says, you, you love me, you obey what I'm saying. The second one, I want to, number two, is this. We need to get off easy street. Uh-oh. So where does it say that in the Bible? In Matthew 7, 13 and 14. It says, enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life. There are few who find it. Jesus is simply saying this, quit looking for the easy way. Quit looking for the shortcut. Quit looking to jump through the, the system. Choose the way that challenges us to be different than somebody else. Jesus says, I've called you out to be different. I've called you to walk in a new way. See, we get in a habit, I think, sometimes in life of just doing what we need to do to get by. We're going to do just enough to pay my bills. I'm going to do just enough to get this car. I'm going to do just enough. And we do the same thing spiritually. We're going to do just enough to be saved. We're going to be just en do just enough to hear and think and know that we're loved by God, that we're saved Instead of understanding that God has a calling and a purpose on our life, which is to glorify Him. No matter what we're going through, God wants to use all things together for good. He wants to take our struggles and take those difficulties and do something with them. But so many times we let the difficult stuff keep us from becoming and walking through and developing things in our life that's going to enable us to be a mighty man or a mighty woman of God. We don't take ownership of it. We don't want to deal with issues that are difficult. We don't want to do the training. We don't want to become this thing that can really glorify God. Think about Jesus. When Jesus came, it wasn't just in words, was it? It was in everything he did. Jesus owned his calling. He came here knowing what was going to be before him, knowing what was going to happen, and he owned it. He went through the fire. He was trained through the process. He was able to go all the way to the cross of Calvary and, 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 and ultimately glorify God as well as making a way for us. But what about our lives? 
So many times we check out because I want to do this easier thing. I want to go this way instead of going through some of this stuff and facing some of the stuff and allowing God to do what he really wants to do. We let difficulty keep us from becoming and doing instead of facing things with passion. See, everything in life doesn't have to, we don't have to take it as a negative. It doesn't mean that we're no good. Sometimes if we look at it from this lens and know that God's taking me through this, this, this difficult way because he wants to do something that I never would have done without it. And facing it with a little bit of passion instead of wanting to give up because we know that if God be for us, like the song we sang, then what shall be against us? And having a little passion like Colossians 3.23 when it says, whatever you do, Work at it heartily. Do it with all of your might as for the Lord rather than for men. Think about the men and the women in the Word of God that actually did some stuff, that actually really became some. Think about Isaiah. Isaiah was this man, and he had this encounter with God, and he says, send me, I'll go for you. I understand the calling on my life, and I'll go. What about Jeremiah? When Jeremiah knew that he was going to be a prophet that nobody was going to listen to, but he said, I know God's called me before he formed me in my mother's womb. He had plans for me. Bring this thing on. I'm going to go through this. Are you with me? What about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? They could have bowed down and said, wait, we're sorry, king. We're just playing. We'll worship you. But instead, they said, we don't care. Throw us in the fire. If God will save us from it, but even if he don't, we're going to glorify God. How many times do we shrink back when life gets difficult or shrink back when the pavement ends and turn away and God say, man, you don't understand. You were right at this point. I was taking you through this way because I wanted to develop some stuff in you. I wanted to develop some stuff in your children that was going to enable you to be a real world changer. That's pretty good right there. Number three. Yeah, forget it. If I got to beg for applause, don't give it. <laughs> Number three is this. Deny ourselves. Jesus says, deny yourself. Luke 9, 23. This is one of the first scriptures that really, really challenged me. You know, the scriptures with, before that were, God love you and you're so good, Carter. And oh, man, oh, wow. And I remember reading this one and wrestling with this one. And he said, he, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself. He must take up his cross daily and follow me. It's a whole different message than the world says. It's a whole different message. The world says, take care of you. Make it about you. Do what you want to do. Put yourself ahead. And Jesus says, deny yourself. Quit looking for someone else to do for you and get your own cross. And you get to work and follow me. Come get this thing. See, the kingdom of God that Jesus came and he offers is lay your life down. Is give it away. And here's a little secret. That when we quit making everything about us, we're going to really start living. In a marriage, when we quit expecting everything from our spouse and for her or him to do everything I want them to do, and we start laying our lives down for our spouse, which is what a man's supposed to do for his wife, by the way, and protect them and fight for them and lift them up, this is when a marriage really starts. This is when the sparks really start flying, when we start laying our lives down for someone else in relationship. Happens in church. Everybody wants to know how you're going to serve me. What's the song service going to be like? What's he going to preach today? All this stuff. All and on and on. And we're doing it with all the wrong motives. Instead, if we would lay our stuff down, lay our lives down, and start being more focused about somebody else who needs a breakthrough worse than I do, all of a sudden, we're going to start to live. I don't know about your story, but I know my story, and it wasn't until I laid my life down that I really started finding some joy in life. And I know I still don't smile a lot, don't laugh enough for a lot of people, but I got more joy now than I ever had before. You should have saw me then. <laughs> Number four, a whole lot like it, is help others. Have mercy. I love the story, one you're all familiar with, but it's a story about the Good Samaritan in Luke chapter 10. And he goes through, and it talks about this man's traveling along, and he gets robbed. This man gets robbed, and so this priest is coming along the road. And when he sees the man in the ditch, what did he do? He moved to the other side. Oh, I didn't see nothing. Did y'all see anything? He moves on. 
He got a service to be in front of. He leaves and passes the guy by who's dying in the ditch. So then the Levite comes. This is the church. The Levite comes and he sees him and he moves over to the other side and he walks by him too. But then this Samaritan, Joe Blow, from the country shows up and he sees him. And he's not a religious man. And he has no title in the church. And it says he stops and he helps the man and he doctors the man and he puts him on his own donkey and he takes him to town to the inn and he puts him up in the inn and he takes care of him he pays for his stay and he says by the way I'm leaving him here I gotta go if he spends more money than this then I'll settle up with you when I come back and then Jesus asked them he said so who was the real neighbor to this man who really loved this man and they were like the Samaritan and you gotta understand that the Samaritan to the Jews were filthy they were trash. They were like this half-breed, inbreed, not even considered a race. They were nothing. But Jesus told this story as an example to the elite church people who were questioning him to make this statement. And then he said, I want you to go in verse 37 and do the same. Go and do the same. Go and help. In other words, Jesus is saying this, I don't care who you are. I don't care who your parents are. I don't care where you go to church. I don't care what your position in life is. He said, if you love me and you know me, then you're going to have to start learning how to help other people. It reminds me of the story of John when he was reinstated in John chapter 21. Excuse me, about Peter. And when he asked Peter, he says, Peter, do you love me? Three times he said, yeah, I love you, Lord. And he said this, then you're going to have to feed my sheep. You're going to have to take care of my sheep. You're going to have to help guide my sheep. Don't worry about being in front of them. Don't worry about who you are, but worry about taking care of somebody else. Worry and consider laying our lives down. So I'm going to stop. Hollywood, would you help me? The bottom line is this. We are called to love God. Somebody say, love God. The question is, are we doing it? How do we do on this test? There's many more scriptures, many more different topics that we could challenge ourselves on. Are we forgiving people or how are we doing this or well, all this on and on and on. But if we just ask ourselves honestly and we want to love God and we know that we're called to love God, then we have to consider, am I obeying? Am I walking in obedience? Am I trying to do? We're never going to be perfect. That's not the point. The point is, are we striving? Are we willing to turn away from some stuff in our life? Are we willing to do some things that are difficult that the Lord asks us to do sometimes. Are we a serving church or are we just a church that gathers? Because I'm telling you that if you want to serve, we've got plenty of opportunities for you to serve. We have now been blessed with the Hub and Roby. But the Hub and Roby is nothing but a building if we don't have people to serve. But if we have people to serve, we can reach and touch the multitudes. And it's not just in church and it's not just at a place somewhere. It's everywhere we go. But it's up to us if we're going to be obedient. It's up to us if we're going to take this seriously. Or we can just be a Pharisee and a, and a Levite and a priest. And we can just keep walking by through life with our blinders on thinking it's just about us. And it's just about where I want to get. And it's just about where I want to go. Or we can hear what God is saying and where he's asking us to go. How do we do it? How do we, how do we love God? We be obedient. We take action. We obey his commands. We do what he asks. Not, not to be a rule follower. Not because that's going to make us okay. That's not it. We do these things because God has loved me and changed me in such a way. It's not me doing it. It's not because I'm good. It's not because we're more blessed. It's not because, I mean, all that's part of it, but that's not why we do it. We do it because he loves us. And we understand it. 1 John 4, 19, we love because God first loved us. This is what changes the world. It's not our appearance. It's not what we do, per se. It's not what we achieve, not what we accomplish, not where we live, not where we go to church. It's how we love. How we love. God wants to change our life by his love. Have you experienced his love? 
his real love. The one when nobody else loved you. The one when you really didn't deserve it. And we were doing everything that we shouldn't have done. And God was still loving us. This is a story of humanity. When humanity turned their back on God. And they said, we'll do it our way. And God sent his son. God sent his son, Jesus. Because God says, love is not in words, but love is an action. For God so loved the world, he sent his son. And the problem is that there are many of us who are starved to death for love. And that's why we're not effective at loving God. And we're not effective at loving other people. Because we've been damaged, and we feel like we're no good, and we feel like all this stuff. And we're hoping that something changes. And can I tell you that what's got to change is this. It's understanding how much God loves you. He sent his son who came and taught and shared and everything he did. And when they rejected him, he says that, I love you this much. Hang me up on the cross. You can't take it away. You can't blot it out. You can never change the fact that I love you. And he loves you. And until we see that, and until we understand it, we're going to continue to go through life as a teenager trying to rebel against the parents and do something that we want to do and think they don't know what we're talking about. But once we understand this love that God has for us, it can change everything. God loves you. Look at somebody and say, God loves you. Look at somebody else and say, God loves you. Now look them in the eye and say it, man, because this is it. Life is difficult. Life is hard. But never forget, man, that God loves you. He loves you young people. He loves you when you mess up at home. He loves you when you mess up at school. He loves you. He loves you. He loves you. And he wants you to love him back. What's the Lord saying to you? Father, we love you. We thank you for meeting in this place. God, we thank you for loving us. And so, Lord, I just pray in this place, Father, for someone who's hurting. and someone their heart's hard. And there's a reason, God. They've been hurt, Lord. We've all been hurt in some way. But, Lord, we're, maybe we're here today and we're just like, you have no idea what I've grown up through. What I've experienced in my life. How I felt. So, all this stuff. And. Lord, I just pray that you would break through all of that, God. They would see you high and lifted up even as their eyes are closed and you hanging on the cross with your arms open wide saying, come to me, all you who are weary and all you who are heavy laden, those who you don't, you don't know who you are and you don't understand it. But, Lord, they would see you saying, come to me and trust me because I died for you today. I died for you years ago, but I want you to see it today. I love you. You're accepted. You're called to be a child of God. This is the love of the Father. Coming after his children. Father, help us be those of us who understand this love. Father, to understand that you've called us to walk in obedience. We're not trying to be rule followers, but God, just understand we all need to repent from some stuff. I know in my life I have to repent often. God, let us not be ashamed to repent, for repentance brings freedom. Repent removes wrongs. It sets us free, God. Let us be a people that's challenged by, to, to follow you and not always take the easy road. God, help us to be a people that's compassionate, Father, and we want to reach out and we want to be a help to someone else. That we'd be a people that's full of mercy. Lord, I just pray that you meet us in this place. If you've never accepted Jesus, but today you understand what he did for you, and you want to accept that love, and you say, I need that love, I need Jesus, would you just slip your hand up and say, I need that love. I need this Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Father, I just pray that you would come alive in their hearts right now, even as they raise their hand, God, that there's a shift in their life, Father, that you begin to give them a new heart, that they understand they become a new creation in you, that you love them and you're never going to leave them. For the rest of us, God, I just pray that on some point, maybe it was something that wasn't even said today, but we would say, you know what, I haven't been obe being obedient here. And you would give us the strength to come before you in repentance today and just say, God, I'm laying this down and I want to walk with you cleanly. If that's you, then I want to just encourage you to come to the altar. Listen to the Lord as we close in worship. He loves you. How will you respond? If you just raised your hand for the first time as we close, I would encourage you to come and just... Let myself, 
or Kirk or somebody here pray with you just to confirm the decision that you just made. The altars are open as we close in worship. Have your way in this time in Jesus' name.